Well, good morning. Uh, we are still working our way through some basic uh, Bible truths. We've been spending quite a bit of time on who is God and a correct view of God as a foundation for our faith. And last week we shifted gears a little bit and to who is man and how a correct view of who man is is also important as a foundation to our faith and how we live our lives. So we want to talk a little bit this morning about origins of man. And I realize that this is also, along with some of the other stuff we have looked at recently, fools walk in where angels fear to tread. Because this is a very extremely controversial issue in our day. Where did man begin? How did, and, and it's more than just what happened, it's how did it happen and what do those origins have to do with us even today? If, I mean, we're here, we can see that we are here, but what does it mean for us in the way we live our lives and the choices that we make? Does it matter? And we're going to hopefully see that maybe it does make a difference. There are a couple of major ideas out there of how man began that you will find and all of you will go, oh yeah, I know that. The first one is what they call fiat creationism. That's Genesis chapter 2. The idea that God by fiat or by declaration said, there he will be. And we'll look at that scripture in a little bit. But the idea that God created it, he did it by command, and that everything that we see, including mankind, was created just like that. And then there is the one called naturalistic Whoop. I know that I need that one. Creationism. How did I get that in there? I got the wrong word. Naturalistic evolution. So it's supposed to be up there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Naturalistic creationism is a blend of both. And somehow I managed to get those two doubled up there. But there are, so the basic ones on the, on the, the right and the left, whichever way you want to look at it, one side says God did it and God only did it. The other side says there's this thing called evolution. And, and that it all came out of natural, so quote unquote, causes from whatever spark that happened a long time ago and over eons of time, then all the things that you know, including man, have somehow evolved or developed out of that. Those are the kind of two opposite ends of the spectrum. In between that are the naturalistic creationism is one of them and several different blends where folks from the, the, the creation side, those who are reading their scriptures are going, I am torn. I'm looking at Genesis and it says God created and I want to believe what we have already studied about the Bible and so I want to believe that. And yet here's all this science stuff I'm getting bombarded with in school and in the media and every place. How do I deal with that? And interestingly enough, even within the material that I am using, which is pretty, I think, good, solid stuff, the guy that wrote the book is really wrestling with this one. Because he's looking at science, and he's looking at, or so-called science, <coughs> anyway, he's looking at the scriptures, and he's saying, how do I handle both of these? This morning, I hope we can at least touch on it. And why does it matter? It matters because... If God didn't do it, then who gets to decide what's right or wrong or what we do or not do? Is there any overarching thing that guides and commands and directs? And the answer is probably no. Then it's just a group think process and those in the group who have the most influence can choose and decide how life should be structured, what it ought to look like, and they're the ones that get there. <coughs> kind of form everybody else. If indeed God did it by fiat, then he is the one that is superior to us and we may very well owe something to him. I take you back to a slide that we've had before. Here is the crux of the issue for us as Christians. Inerrancy, the dependability of God's word. Do we really believe it? We've talked about it before. We've been through this very same slide. Does the Bible contain error or not? Is everything in it accurate 
as it says, when correctly interpreted in the light of the culture and times in which it was written, and in view of the purposes for which it was given, fully truthful in all that it affirms. Therefore, when God said, I shall make man this way, what does he mean by that? Did he really say that? Did he really create it or not? How then, if you believe that, do you deal with the science of evolution? And I put science in quotes there because I want you to kind of filter a little bit what you see and hear out there because it is all over the place. And when you hear it on the news or when you read about it in a magazine, you will read about the theory of evolution. I want you to understand that the press and the common usage it gets thrown in there because it means, well, the idea of evolution as opposed to the idea of creation, these two opposing ones. And they use it kind of generically. But theory is a scientific term, and it's very specific. And the way they use it is incorrect. Evolution is not a theory. Scientifically speaking, if they're going to be accurate, a theory is an idea of how something works that can be tested to demonstrate if it's valid or not. In other words, if you think your theory is that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, you will put water in a container with a thermometer and turn up the heat and you will watch that thermometer and you can test it and show, yep, sure enough, it does. That happens at that temperature. I have now proved my theory that this is what happened. And that's why my car overheated when it got too hot with no antifreeze in it. And when you put antifreeze in it, it's a higher temperature before it boils. That's why you put it in there for hot weather. So a theory can be tested. How do you test something that happened in the past? You can't. You can't go back and redo evolution or redo creation. So how do you address that? Well, the way you do that is the second term up there is called a model. What you do is you say, I think this is how it might have happened. And if I believe that this is how it might have happened, then what would I expect to see out of that? Well, then this should be apparent, and that should be apparent, and that should be apparent. And so then I go out and I look at what's out there and say, does that fit? And if it doesn't fit, then you have to adjust your model over here to make it then describe what you see happen. So if you have a... If you have someone who is pro-evolution and you want to at least find out if they are honest about evolution and the way that they look at it, ask them what the weaknesses in their model are. Ask them what things that they have to wrestle with to explain in the model. Because there are many things in the data set out here that you look at that do not fit. So, I don't want to get a whole thing into evolution, but I want at least you to get to thinking about that and realize that while they put it out there as fact, in fact, it's a model that attempts to describe what we see today based on what they think happened back then, and you will find them constantly adjusting and trying to find ways to adjust things to explain because there are things out there that you can't explain. Uh, the other thing I mentioned there is when you see the weather forecasters doing weather forecasting and we all gripe about how terrible a job they do, the, the thing they use as a tool is, is a model, a computer model that they say based on when this happens and that happens and the other things happen in the atmosphere in past history, what we know is this what drives the weather and causes this. So there's a European model, there's an American model and these different models of the weather, and they look at all of them and say, well, we know this is going on in the Pacific, and that's going on in the Atlantic, and there's El Nino going on here. And when those come together, usually it would predict this to happen. <coughs> Only thing is it's so complicated, once in a while it doesn't work. And then we complain. It didn't rain like they said. I want to take you back, though, and look at the beginnings just a little bit so you understand history a little bit. And in order to really understand the, the battle we have with this whole idea of evolution as it affects us here, 
I want you to realize where it came from. And it's really important to kind of get your mind around that, and then you will understand why it's such a powerful force in our society today. It began, of course, when everybody knows Charles Darwin. You've all heard the word in the Voyage of the Beagle, and his theory there, his theory, his model he developed came out, and it was 1809 to 1882 is when he lived, and somewhere around in the 1830s to 1850s, I forgot to look up the date when he did the voyage and came up with this book that swept the world. But you need to understand what's happening then. What's going on in the world? Well, this is the beginnings of what they call the Industrial Revolution. We're going away from a time when people lived out in little villages were serfs of a few landholders out there with very little industrialized anything. Everything was village-oriented, craft-oriented, and we're shifting into a time when steam power is taking over the world. But at the same time, it's interesting, one of the things I read said even more important than the idea of steam power, which everybody has promoted as being the thing that drove in this whole industrial revolution, it was the printing press before that. Gutenberg's Bible, the first thing printed on the printing press, how interesting. That is so powerful because before that, if you are, say, a blacksmith, and you want to pass on all the knowledge you gained in 50 years of being a blacksmith, how did you do it? Verbally through an apprentice, right? So you find an apprentice, and he comes in, and this young man, and he works under you, and he hammers and does all the dirty work, and he learns from you the trade of being a blacksmith, and that one individual can pick up whatever you knew and mix it with whatever creativity he has, and things can incrementally move forward. But what if you can take all the knowledge you learned in 50 years as a blacksmith, write it down, and spread it across Europe, and every blacksmith apprentice in the entire area can see what you came up with, put their original ideas with it, and add to it. That's what the printing press did for everything. It just swept the world, changed everything. So in the 1800s, the world's changing really fast. Technology is exploding, and agriculture is going crazy because they're discovering fertilizer. And as they discover the ability to fertilize crops, they can grow more food, you can feed more people, you have less malnutrition, you have a greater population, you have more people able to work, the economics changes, the banking industry changed, everything changed in this revolution. All that's going on as Charles hops on the boat and goes sailing around South America to the Galapagos Islands and other places. Yeah, and you find all these interesting animals, and all of a sudden you now have, you think about what's the mindset of man and civilization as all these new technologies and things are exploding, and the knowledge base that they have, and all of a sudden man can do wondrous and amazing things. And man now has a non-religious answer to why man is here. You no longer are stuck with the church or some, the gods and all that sort of thing. You're starting to find scientific and technological answers for things. And I have to take you to, uh, I don't know if I could find it. I had it right here a minute ago, but I didn't turn it. I was looking in Ecclesiastes, and it talks about how uh, within the heart of man is this lost it. Turn on the page and it's gone. Okay. Within man is this bent towards doing his own thing and, uh, and, and away from God, basically. The, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes could see that is in the society around him. And this fits right in with that. We now have a non-religious answer to why we're here, which leads to a non-religious answer to what is moral or not. And of course we think morality, we immediately think of things like sexual sins and stuff like that, but it's bigger than that. It's really interesting if you look at the industrial revolution in America, those industrialists whose names now are household names because they are foundations and things, Carnegie, uh, Rockefeller, 
all of those guys, those were the guys that started the big corporations and it was part of what happened here. Many of those guys believed this guy Darwin because Darwin said, survival of the fittest. And they believed that as those who were successful in <coughs> economics and in business, that survival of the fittest applied and therefore you could use the masses to do labor because you were more fit, more smart, more able, and therefore it was okay to use labor like fuel to build the industry that they built. Our nation and all those things were built on guys that believed in this. So it affects how you look, what's moral, what's right, how do you treat your employees, how do you, all those things are driven by how you believe man is there. So then the question at the bottom is, is the model we have driven by science or is science driven by the model? If you are convinced and believe that this is the way man is created, are you then looking for science evidence to back that up? Or are you looking at the evidence that's out there and saying, how does that change my model? It's, and I didn't have time to dredge up the quote because I just thought of it this morning, but I have a book that talks about the battle between creation and evolution. And there's a famous evolutionist who promotes theory works really hard at it, and they were talking about the odds of these things happening, and there are zeros to the umpteenth, you know, zeros cut across the room, chance of, and, of something happening. And the guy, was, his quote was to the effect, I need to find it for you so I can accurately attribute it. But basically what he said is, I know the probabilities are wildly beyond anything we can imagine, and yet it happened, and it had to happen because the alternative is God. And I will not accept that. So, what are the beginnings of the creation model? The beginnings of the creation model begin in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image after our likeness so they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over all the creatures to move on the earth. There is the beginning of creationism where God recorded in Genesis, this is what I plan to do. And then he created humankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That's, that's kind of a brief overview. And then later we go, and he goes into more detail as to how he did it. And he said, the Lord God formed man from the soil of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So that tells us a couple of things about here that's important about who we are. One is, God did it. So that puts God in a position relative to us that we need to pay attention to. That puts us down here as the clay and him up here as the potter. If you get that image, he's the one who made us the other interesting thing, and it explains a lot if you think about it, he says, we are created in whose image? His image. And yet we know that God, the Father at least, until Christ had a physical human body, has no physical body, so how could we be in his image? So it has to be something different than just physical. And if you look at what do we share with the rest of God's creation with the animal kingdom? We all have eyes, we have hair, we have ears, you know, we have internal body parts that are very similar. Some can even be used in us, you know, when they first started doing heart issues, they would use pigs' hearts and things like that to keep them going. So we have things that we share with the rest of the animal kingdom, and yet how come we don't have any cats and dogs and cows and stuff in here, sitting in here with us, discussing these issues? Because they do not have the image of God in them, which is the ability to relate to God, the ability to have these kinds of thoughts and understanding, and they will try to show you how chimpanzees can use tools, and there's some very rudimentary things they can do that are similar to what we can do, but none of them are making music, creating poetry. 
those kinds of things are unique to humanity, and they, I am certain, smack of the image of God. That that's part of what he has placed within us. Uh, the other interesting thing I ran across talks about form from the soil of the ground. And when you go through scientifically and look at what we're made up of, there's a big percent of us are all these basic elements that are in the earth and water. You're mostly water. I hate to tell you that. No, you're not. In spite of what you tend to think about people standing up when you're talking, they're not mostly full of hot air, they're mostly full of water. So, anyway. Well, the creation model works great in church. We can pull out our Bibles and all that. Sort of thing. What about science? What about out there in the media and the schools? What is this? How do you deal with that? And the way you deal with that, one tool that I'm going to give you this morning is called the Institute for Creation Research. If you have not heard of them, or maybe you have, and it's been a while since you've listened to or heard. I'm gonna, they have a website, which Kathy has loaded up for us. I want to just take you there for a second. Here is a tool that helps you evaluate the world around you scientifically that's looking at it from the model perspective of creation. If you have a model that says it was created by God, is there, then, can you look out there scientifically at the world and support that model? Here is the website. It's a little busy maybe to see way that far away. But you can go there. They have lots of resources. One of the little things they have, you scroll down there, right? There's, there's research, education, communication. Down here is videos. They, if you like videos, it's your way of learning and hearing stuff. You can click on that. And they have a number of videos that talk about different issues. And we picked one that's kind of a shorter one just to give you a taste. Here is the one you may have read about on the internet or in the news. Chimpanzee DNA being really, 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 really close to what people are. Well, maybe not. We got sound? We've all heard the theory that chimps are close human relatives, but is there any truth to that? Secular scientists claimed in the 1970s that chimp genomes are 98% similar to humans, and it was apparently verified by more modern techniques. But that estimate actually used isolated segments of DNA that we already share with chimps, not the whole genomes. The latest comparison to include all of the DNA between the two species revealed only 70% identity. A huge difference from what scientists have been claiming for years. And a 70% similarity really isn't surprising. Chimps and humans, and even dogs, cats, horses, and more, share some basic similarities. Metabolizing foods, growing hair, breathing air, and drinking water. So of course, much of the genetic material would have to be the same. But chimps don't have the intellectual abilities of humans to create or communicate, or the creative abilities in their hands. For example, they cannot build hospitals, operate on one another, play baseball, or write poetry. So it makes sense that when new research compared each chimp chromosome piece by piece to the corresponding human chromosome pieces, they were 30% different. In fact, 900 million DNA letter differences separate the two species. Far too many precise and vital bits of information for any source other than genius intelligence to generate. Chimps and humans are very different, not only in their anatomy and behavioral traits, but also in their genomes. When the entire genomes of humans and chimps are compared, it becomes clear that they were each engineered uniquely and separately by an omnipotent, genius creator. For more easy-to-understand scientific evidence that confirms Genesis, check out our 12-part DVD series on the science of creation at unlockingthemysteriesofgenesis.org. Another sample, but again, this is this is your worldview. How does your worldview fit with what we are as Christians, what we believe as Christians, and how do you connect that? Well, here are tools that you can use to help you as you take your view that here's my model. Can I support it? What I see out there. Uh, can we get PowerPoint back for a long <coughs> shot? I got. One last slide I'd like to share with you. Some of you are familiar with this verse. It's at the bottom. You may recognize Psalm 139. And David writes this, and it's interesting. With all the stuff that you would say they didn't know, 
in those days compared to what we know now, how accurately he's able to describe uh, what he believes about himself in relationship to his God. He says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Psalm 139, 13 through 16. I love that verse because it says, I know that you did this, God, that you formed me, that you had a plan for me, and that even before I was made, you knew it. And the other thing that I suggest to you that people out there everywhere in Ecclesiastes would back me up says eternity is in their soul is the way the writer of Ecclesiastes describes it. And right there it says, my soul knows it very well. I submit to you that those, even the ardent in folks in ep for evolution, have back in there somewhere just like that one fellow I told you about, their soul knows that there is a God, and if they admit that there is a God, then they are answerable to Him. And they reject that idea, and therefore they reject creationism. It's not because of the science. It's because of the heart attitude that's looking at the science. If the will says, I don't want to yield to God, i got to find some way to explain why I don't want to do that. And evolution is the tool. What did Linnea say? Well, she said that Dr. McGee's quote was that it has to do with the will. It's more than anything else. It's the idea that if I refuse or reject God, then, then the way we're made up, we've got to find some way to cover for that. And so our excuse is, there is no God. And the scripture says, the fool says in his heart, no God. Not, there is no God. He just says, no God. I reject the idea of God. I reject the idea that I answered anyone. And, and what you see in the world, and the reason why all the things that are now becoming okay, that you said when I was growing up, or years back you look at it, and these things were taboo, and you couldn't go there, and it was not accepted, is because we've said, no God. We are evolved, therefore, whatever you feel like you want to do, uh, or as in the book of, uh, of Judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We're right back there in the same place they were then. We thought we did things. We are out of time. This is close. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning, for challenging us a little bit in our thinking about who we are and uh, why we are here Help us to evaluate these things in the world around us carefully, to realize that, uh, yes, in the marketplace of ideas, evolution, and all these things are just a, they're another idea. They seem to be a prevalent one these days. But they are ideas that are driven from a motive that says, no God. And Father, help us to understand that, uh, uh, that your word is true. And that we need to make a decision because if we decide that your creation account, Lord, is not accurate, then we have no ability to decide which part of your scripture anywhere is accurate. And it's all up for grabs and we are ultimately without confidence in our salvation. Father, help us to realize the importance of these things to, uh, to have that impact on our lives and help us to realize and, and see that you have provided us tools for our minds that you created to use, that we don't have to say, well, I believe in creationism and I shut off my brain and don't believe in science, but that we can use science that it's there, you created it, we should not be afraid of it, but we need to be careful how we look at it. Father, thank you for our time together this morning, in Jesus' name.